Hello, Firewood friends. It's Mike with KNL Firewood, and today we have Megan Abraham, and she is from the DNR. And uh, tell us your title. I'm actually the state entomologist, but that's just a shortened way to say division of entomology and plant pathology for us. You know that we're certified in the state of Indiana to uh, sell firewood, and when the uh, lady came out to certify us, I started asking all these questions about invasive species and bugs and what the trees are going to do in the future. And she said, you know what, why don't you talk to Megan? Tell us, tell me what you just told me about the difference between invasive species and the species we have already. Okay, so the invasive species, ones that are not from around here, would not have evolved um, with our insects, which means that they wouldn't have any natural competition or natural predators, right? So anything that moves here from an area that's not around this immediate area wouldn't have to compete with those sources for food, which means that they can often take over areas, which also means that they are most likely to attack healthy trees versus our native insects like a borer or something that would have evolved here and would maybe only attack a tree that was already in failing health. So a lot of times we find our invasives are causing damage because they don't have those natural predators and those natural competition. Something else that was really interesting we talked about is uh, the big thing in the, in the firewood community is the emerald ash borer, right? Everybody knows about that, but there are some other insects that are that are here or are coming, maybe not to Indiana, but definitely United States, that are just as bad, if not worse. So since everyone is somewhat familiar with the ash borer, um, she brought little samples. I'll do my best to show you here. That, Megan, tell them what that is. That's the larva of one emerald ash borer. And that's the part of the life cycle that actually impacts these ash trees. Now, emerald ash borer will only get into ash trees so they don't impact any other hardwood species besides ash, but there are several different varieties, as you know, of ash. Mm -hmm. And what they do is they lay their eggs on the outer bark of an ash tree. Get that a little closer. Yeah. And then it, that egg hatches and burrows under, and the, the single larva will actually eat its way through this spongy layer of the tree, if you can see that there. And that's what actually damages the tree because once it's eaten, it can no longer use that pathway to feed the tree um, or share nutrients from the roots to the leaves and then the leaves back to the roots to keep the tree alive. Um, and that's essentially strangling the ash tree. So that eventually it'll, this tree will hit a, a tipping point and it can't recover from the damage that an emerald ash borer does. So this when material will never there? go back. So when it goes in there as the larva, mm -hmm. the larva eat these little tunnels, uh -huh. they grow into the, to the borer uh -huh. that we know of, and then it escapes? Yes. It no, yes. Longer, it no, no longer sticks around. It goes no. on to another ash tree. Absolutely, okay. yes. It can go to the same tree, but it goes to a different location to lay its eggs. Um, and the only evidence on the outside for a newly infested tree that you can see are these D-shaped exit holes. It's a capital D shape, and it's pretty, um, pretty common to see for only the emerald ash borer. Most of our native borers will have uh, circle-shaped exit holes instead of the D-shaped. And then this is surprisingly the, uh, the uh, is this the it's borer? The adults, this, yes. is the, this is the adult, right? Yes, and so um, people are often surprised because we put these guys on billboards and posters all over the place at how small they are, but they can actually fit on a penny. Yeah, he's a little dude, yeah. man. I thought these were more like cricket size, yes. probably. Yeah. But they are, uh, they are small. Yeah. So it's hard to spot the adults. That's kind of the lesson on this one. You're gonna see woodpecker damage on trees that are brand new infested. The woodpeckers have figured out it's a good food source. Mm -hmm. That's good. Yeah. Um, but they can come in and kind of cause their own havoc and damage making those exit holes a lot bigger. Sure, sure. sure. Um, so the one thing that comes up, and we'll move on from ash here in a minute, but the one thing that keeps coming up, and we talked about it briefly earlier, is what does the species of ash look like? What's the future of that? Right. So there's been a lot of work done by scientists um, on ash recently and the hope is that we can find a resistant variety. So they have been searching for ash trees that don't look like they're impacted in the woods 
Um, and when you find one of those, you're asked to contact the DNR and let us know so that we can come out and collect seeds or you can collect seeds on behalf of the scientists. Um, and they're taking those species and they are cross breeding them, trying to come up with a resistant variety of the ash tree that in the future we'll be able to plant. Um, unfortunately, that doesn't save the 7% of the fire of the, the woods that was ash in the past, and, and I don't think in our lifetime we'll ever see that again, um, because you have to intentionally plant the new ash sure. in order to take over. Um, but it, hopefully at some point there will be some ash in our environment again because it does make a lovely tree. Yeah, so there is some natural resistance in some of the trees. We're trying to duplicate that right. and uh, create a, a resistant tree. That's yes. awesome, that's good news. Yes. Um, there's actually an ash tree right over there. We're gonna go take a close up just real quick. And these okay. trees are kind of dangerous now when they're standing and still um, in place. Um, so there is some danger to having them around in an area where people frequent. Sure. Um, so it's a good idea to take them down before they do fall. Sure. They made a fantastic street tree when Dutch elm disease came through and knocked down all the elm trees. Uh -huh. And now we've got emerald ash borer and it's knocking out entire neighborhoods full of ash trees. So this insect is actually gypsy moth, which is now officially called spongy moth. The uh, insect's name was just officially changed this year um, and it's an insect that we've been dealing with here in Indiana for over 30 years but a lot of people still haven't heard about it. This insect has been in the United States for over 150 years um, and there is a program called Slow the Spread that is solely responsible for making sure that this insect doesn't spread too far too fast um, and so we've know we've known for a long time now that we can't eradicate this insect now it's all about treating it in the in the leading edge to make sure that um, we're slowing down how fast it spreads across the country so there are 13 states currently working on this management program with slow spread um, and they range from Minnesota down to uh, Kentucky down and over to the Virginias um, and that's the leading front, essentially, of this insect that showed up 150 years ago on the East Coast. What effect does it have, it on, have on trees around here? And right. what trees does it affect? Right. So there are several different species of trees that the, the uh, spongy moth likes to attack. Um, mostly hardwood, but it will lay its eggs on evergreens as well. Um, and if in a vine, it will feed on those evergreens. Um, these guys are really voracious feeders. First of all, the females can't fly, so the males will fly to them and um, they will create insect babies and lay their eggs in a tree and there'll be hundreds of insect eggs um, in these little patches here that, that look like sponges, which is how it's got its name now, spongy moth. Um, and these little sponges are full of eggs that'll hatch in the spring and all the caterpillars are head to the top of the tree to start feeding. Each little caterpillar can eat up to six square feet of, of leaf litter, so if it, it can completely defoliate these trees. Now, for the most part, during the summer, these trees tend to recover, but year after year of complete defoliation in this cycle can weaken the tree and let it be um, taken down by an, any other kind of pathogen. So it's not something we want to let happen here in the United States. And so we do several different treatments every year in Indiana and across those other 13 states um, to make sure that we're pinpointing exactly where the new infestations are showing up and doing what we can to control those species. We'll do one treatment that's BTK, which is a naturally forming bacteria in our soil uh, that kills the caterpillars. And we spray it on the, the top of the canopy and the other one is a pheromone that's released during the mating cycle for these insects and it makes it so that the males can't find the females to mate and then there's less caterpillars. We're having a little bit of help with all of that corn and soybean in the middle of the state. It kind of breaks it up and makes it harder for those insects to travel. Um, but these are still ones that can move in firewood accidentally. If you can imagine this little spongy egg mass can travel anywhere anybody moves any kind of insect or any firewood that has it on it.
so here's here's the next little guy um, the Asian longhorn beetle and I told Megan I said I know I've seen one of these in the wood yard and she said probably not and here's probably what you have seen yes so there's a white spotted pine sawyer that looks an awful lot like our Asian longhorn beetle but instead of these white and black striped antenna it's going to have all black antenna and then the back of it its beetle um, carapace the shield on it covering its wings is going to be a little bit more sparkly and white and black dotted so it's a little more mottled than our very clear black and white friend here um, but this Asian longhorn beetle is a really bad insect the Asian longhorn beetle is an insect that we've been watching and keeping an eye out for quite a few years now um, because of how in how much damage it can cause this insect instead of eating the outside of the tree will actually penetrate through the middle of these hardwood trees it's a really stout and thick beetle larva and, and it eats through the middle of the tree so much so that eventually those trees become riddled with this damage and can snap in windstorms. Um, and we're talking about a lot of different species, not just one like the emerald ash borer. It doesn't care. It'll no, eat whatever. It'll eat all kinds of hardwood. So it definitely prefers maple. Um, so it, have, it has the preference. It will go for the maple, but it will also attack all the kinds of different hardwoods. So our, it'll go after the oak and the ash and all of the others. So it doesn't necessarily like the maple because it's a little softer on the inside. It doesn't really care. It'll go after some of those really right. more dense right. hardwoods like an oak. Yes, and so for states like ours that have a very dense hardwood and a variable hardwood forest, um, there um, is a big danger here in letting this insect get loose. Um, so they have done some eradication efforts and typically when it it comes into an area it's traced back to either firewood or it comes in on pallet stock from Asia um, and those materials come in with these insect larvae in them and the larvae hatch out and start reproducing so these are infestations that the USDA will come in and mitigate um, oftentimes that means removing trees because they've not found an effective killer for this. Unlike emerald ash borer where you can treat the tree and it can feed and can wick up that chemical control into the leaves and all over the tree, um, this insect lives inside the middle of the tree, which means that we can't get to it with any of those kind of chemical controls that we can use on emerald ash borer. So as you were describing with the emerald ash borer, it it kind of lives between the, the bark and, and the meat of the tree, mm -hmm. where this thing bores all the way in, goes to the, to the very inside. Mm -hmm. um, and there's no evidence that it's, ha that it's damaging the tree like you'll see with the ash right. trees. This just eats it from the inside out. And like she was saying, in a, in a big windstorm or something, the tree just snaps over. Yeah. And that could be some of your first indication that there's damage there. And you were saying that... Um, it, it is in Indiana or it is not? It has not in, been found in Indiana, okay. but we are looking for it. And we have found it in Chicagoland area as well as Cincinnati. So we're right in the middle of these two infested areas. Now, we're hoping that we don't have any any infestations found in Indiana. But if anybody does see something that is even close to what a pine sawyer looks like, we'd prefer you guys send us um contact information or even pictures of what you're seeing so we can confirm that okay. it is not Asian longhorn beetle. So at the end of this video, I'm going to uh, put a close up of her card and her contact information, but you heard it here. Um, take a picture of it and send it to somebody. And even if you're not in Indiana, send it to your um, local GNR. Yes. Uh, take a picture of it and send it in. These things are invasive and they're destructive and uh, I find this super interesting. So we're here in uh, central Indiana at a local park neither one of us have really been here so we we're just uh, kind of close to the road you might get some background noise i don't even know what this is i don't know if it was a lightning strike or something but it's <laughs> burnt out uh, oh yeah probably end up like this. Yeah, yeah it's uh it's pretty cool so i thought it'd yeah. be a neat background so uh next on the list what are you gonna talk All about right. here so here in indiana we actually have a brand new invasive species and it's called spotted lanternfly 
this insect really it's a pretty bug it does i know oh, i know man. and there's so many people that love it like it was just on jimmy fallon it's a famous bug oh really um, yeah kate okay. mckinnon got on there and was making the winky face about murdering a poor defenseless spotted lantern fly oh my but gosh the, the real deal is if we want to keep drinking wine we better keep an eye on where this guy okay. goes all right so you either can kill the bug or you can watch it eat all the vines instead of you oh this is the one wine. that does the grapevine yes okay yeah. yeah i saw that so this insect will definitely get in and da do damage on vineyards um so out west they're very concerned about this insect making an impact out there but sure. It uh, started in, in the United States in 2014 in Pennsylvania, um, and since then we've been kind of slowly watching it make its way to Indiana. And this is another good hitchhiker. He lays its eggs on just about every, anything, and unlike the spongy moth where it has that bright white spongy looking egg mass, this one looks like a smear of mud. So it's very difficult to determine when it's actually been in, infested or in materials been bring brought being brought in that is infested um, but the good thing we have going for us is the bright red um, colors that this one insect has um, this is actually an adult spotted lanternfly and when you guys see adult spotted lanternfly they're actually going to look more like this now these guys blend into the trees that they're sitting on really really well so it's very easy to walk right past them um, and not even notice them um, because if they have their preference they'll just hang out on that tree feeding uh, until something comes along and brushes them off or makes them leave. Yeah and that's the adult but again you're not going to see that underwing unless it's moving from one place to another. The other life stages are actually a lot easier to to find um, because they stay still a lot longer but that bright red um, fourth instar there is usually when we start having people let us know that they're spotting them somewhere. That's how we found their, those uh, spe this species in Indiana. Uh, there's two infested sites in Indiana. One of them is in southern Indiana or in Switzerland County. Uh, and there was a gentleman sitting on his porch drinking his morning coffee and he spotted an insect he'd never seen before in Indiana and sent it to us at our email address and that was our first re report of infested spot in Indiana. And, but if we can slow down how fast it gets here just like gypsy moth or spot spongy moth um, then we can uh, make an, a difference for some of the vineyards that here in Indiana as well as in the west coast. So these, these are not here? They are here. They They're are in here. Huntington County and Switzerland County, um, but they've only been here the last south. south yeah, okay. way south. Like can look throw a stone at Kentucky South. Okay. Right. So, um, but um, those are active infestations and ones that we're actively trying to manage and decrease their impact on the surrounding environment. Um, another thing that these guys do will be to feed solely on one tree and they kind of gang up on that one tree um, so much so that the excrement that they leave off will, um, it's, it's like a sweet substance and it attracts a, a mold called city mold. So a lot of times instead of these guys, you'll see the damage that's been left behind by their feeding. Mm -hmm. um, so if there's an, an disturbingly a large amount of sooty mold in area you might want to look a little bit closer to see if you can spot these insects. Okay. All right so talk to us about this little guy this is the agent Asian giant Hornet. Yes. So it's, this is the murder hornet, right? Yes. It's commonly called the murder hornet, but instead of Asian giant hornet, the true name now is actually northern giant hornet. Um, okay. And so the northern giant hornet um, is actually not in Indiana, and there's very little chance that it will make its way here, but it is in the United States. So it's not going to murder us? No, and that's a common misconception, but murder hornet actually refers to murdering of an apiary. So it murders bees. It doesn't murder people. Um, it has no interest in humans. It's solely out for going after honeybee hives to try and find food. Which is um, horrible too. I mean, yes. we don't want the honeybee 
yeah. you know, industry to, to go away or the Absolutely. Honeybees, that, that'd be horrible. Yeah, so the, right now they're supposing that um, this insect made its way to the United States on the West Coast as a food source. Um, people in Asia tend to eat them, the larvae. Um, so somehow those larvae got to the United States and then started making nests out there. And they're working on trying to find all of the active hives and destroying them as they can. But the likelihood of it ending up here in Indiana is very minimal. Um, and even if it did, it would not be able to murder people, just right, right. our aviar industry. I, I was asking her earlier, can we train them to murder Japanese beetles? Oh, don't we wish. <laughs> Um, but yeah, they've doing some great work out there on the West Coast. But here in Indiana, we do have a couple of insects that look like this, which okay. is how people get concerned and contact us at the would DNR. They, would they sting you? No. They Those even other sting. two insects are okay. not very likely to sting you would either. Would sting you? It can, but it really okay, has not, no interest. Okay, gotcha. Okay. So um, unless you're attacking its hive, it tends to stay away from people. So, okay. Well, there you go. Um, okay, so I want to uh, say thank you so much for coming out today. Took time out of your busy schedule. Um, I'm kind of a science guy. I'm kind of a nerd. So uh, this is really super interesting to me, and I think it's going to be interesting to you guys too because we're all in the firewood game together. Uh, this all has uh, potential consequences for us now and in the future. And uh, just to end the video here, I, I think I wanted to ask Megan what we can do as firewood guys, as wood hounds, uh, what we can do to um, make sure there's firewood, you know, for the next generation. And we can c continue cutting these things and uh, just w what can we do to, to help? Right. So the one thing that's actually going to help a lot of our Indiana firewood producers, because they're smaller operations typically, um, is to encourage people to buy local and burn local. Um, the reason that we have so many of these infestations is because people bring firewood long distances, right? So emerald ash borer was up in Detroit, people went camping in Michigan and bought local firewood there, and then instead of disposing it or burning it all there, they brought it back home to Indiana and emerald ash borer started spreading. So the same kind of thing could happen with other insects, including some of the ones that I just showed you today. Obviously, the spongy moth has got little white egg lemon masses that you should be able to see on your firewood if it's on it. Um, but some of these others, like spotted lantern fly, it looks like mud. So being able to discern whether it's a egg mass or it's a, just a chunk of dirty wood um, is difficult to do. Not to mention all of the other invasive species we don't even know about yet. So Im imagine that um, we've got this environment now where we can move things from one side of the world to the other really easily. Overnight we can ship something from a package um, and it makes it very convenient for the way we, work, we live our lives now but it also makes it very dangerous for our environment because we have the ability then to introduce things that should not be here in our environment and haven't evolved with the species that are in our environment. So that means that we need to make sure that we're very good stewards of what we introduce into our environment. Mm -hmm. um, and for firewood, that means buying it locally, burning it locally, um, supplying it locally, supplying right? it locally, absolutely. Um, making sure if it is something that you're shipping into another state, or if you're a larger firewood producer, um, making sure that it's mitigated, and your state Department of Agriculture's or DNR will help you learn how to do that. Um, most of the time, it's either a heat treatment, kiln drying, fumigation, um, even just um, being able to leave it to season for over a year can sometimes dry it out enough to the moisture contents less than 20 percent that makes it less likely to be able to transfer one insect from one location to another or even a pathogen because what we didn't talk about today what is what we can introduce as far as viruses and bacteria and and things like that can also move in firewood so jeez oh, uh, so 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 many um so many things that we can do to kind of harm the environment too you know we think we're just making firewood but I think we've got to be conscious. I think when we're in the wood yard making firewood, if we see something weird, uh, take a picture of it, send it to your local DNR person, send it to your Megan, whoever that <laughs> might be. Um, yeah, I mean, else? and that's the thing, because as I tell people all over the state when I give these talks, 
uh, there's only about 10, 12 of us that work in, for me here at the Division of Entomology in, in Indiana. It has to cover the entire state, and we definitely don't have enough eyes out there without the general public helping us, letting us know if you see something different. So if you see something different, please take the time to send us an email or a question or a picture, or you can just send me a picture at our email address. What is your email address? Our is email easy? address, the easiest one is DEPP at DNR.IN.GOV. Or you can call one eight six six no exotic. Okay, one eight six six no exotic. Yes. Okay. Yeah, and that will reach us at the DNR, um, and we can send an inspector out to take a look. We can okay. identify something through a picture, through an email, sure. um, whatever feels best for them. Okay. Um, and if it, it's the weirdest, ins I get calls on everything. Obviously, we just talked about the um, murder hornet or the northern giant hornet mm -hmm. um, and I've been getting phone calls from all over the country on that one but um, we also get them from local areas and, and that's how we find some of these infestations sure. the spotted lanternfly being the primary at this point um, one was through a Facebook identification the other one was through an email with a picture okay. so that is invaluable and we really appreciate the stewards that you are out yeah. there in the firewood community so so woodhounds pay attention to what you're cutting yeah this little guy is so little that's the uh, emerald ash borer there so small that's the little larva the larva is bigger than the adult <laughs> 